Good morning, everybody. And welcome to our Saturday morning physics, the last one of the term and the end of the 22-23 academic year. Wow, what a year of Saturday morning physics. We're fully back in person, but we're also streaming our events live, an innovation that was developed to keep Saturday morning physics going during um, COVID. Um, and it was made possible by your generous support. Uh, the donuts are back. <laughs> And we've presented quite a program, including learning about black holes, batteries, and the economics of moving electric vehicles, moving to electric vehicles, a presentation of art inspired by science, and the science that inspired that art. And if you haven't yet seen it, you should check out Gina Gibson's exhibit at the uh, Museum of Natural History, which will be there until January. Um, and we had the unique visit in January with astronaut and phys physicist Josh Cassida, live from the International Space Station. Who uh, attended that or saw that event? Yeah, well that was really something. Uh, he joined us for that amazing event and we've invited him back for a Saturday morning physics presentation which is to be scheduled. And if you'd missed any of these or would like to see them again, check out our SaturdayMorningPhysics.org a website to find the full archive. Well, today's event is unique and special and timely. This week, we're celebrating the naming and the dedication of the Homer A. Neal Physics Laboratories, the building facing west uh, towards the Diag that was built in the 1990s when Homer Neal was chair of the department. Yesterday, we officially welcomed and recognized uh, the naming of this building, including the unveiling of a portrait uh, of Dr. Neal, and we're so honored to have members of the Neal family also here with us today for Saturday Morning Physics. Uh, we have uh, Sharon Denise, Neal, and Ariana, daughter and granddaughter, and Carl Lenz, uh, who are here. So please join us in welcoming him. Dr. Neal, he was an amazing individual uh, who was a top scientist, an educator, a leader of universities, including Indiana University, Stony Brook, and the University of Michigan, uh, and he was served as the vice president for research and the interim president of our university, and he presented a Saturday morning physics uh, lecture in 2008. Uh, he grew up in severely segregated Franklin, Kentucky and emerged clearly a prodigy entering Indiana University at the age of 15 and coming to the University of Michigan at 19, the age of many of our first year undergrads. And he began his uh, PhD studies. His research in particle physics measured how when high energy beams of protons, hydrogen nuclei, collide with other protons in a liquid hydrogen target, they emerge spinning. That, it that is, with a systematic orientation of the proton spin. Along with his advisor, Mike Longo, and professors Oliver Overseth and Martin Pearl, they explored proton energies, or speeds, at which we now know the substructure of protons becomes important. At the time, the theory of the process was schematic and did not agree with the data at all. So now we know much more, and in particular, the proton appears to be composed of smaller fundamental pieces, quarks and gluons, which you may have heard of. It remains extremely difficult, vexing at times, to incorporate the theories of these smaller pieces into a description of these phenomena. But the work was, both, was seminal both technically, with new techniques for measuring the spinning protons, and intellectually, and has been followed by decades of research on understanding how spin affects particles like the proton and the neutron, which are called hadrons. Dr. Neal went on to lead major efforts in particle physics that did not focus on spin, but he maintained a keen interest, and he would sometimes come to show me some of the data on angular distributions in proton-proton data and ask what I thought. His legacy uh, includes uh, much what's called spin physics here at Michigan, uh, including current faculty members, uh, Christine Idala, who's here uh, in the audience, and uh, a colleague, Wolfgang Lorenzen. As you'll learn today, um, Michigan Physics has been involved in spin since its invention or discovery in the 1920s. The inventors of spin um, graduated 
in the Netherlands and came to join our faculty. The spin of the proton was the subject of Dr. Neal's PhD research, as I said, and that was invented by David Dennison, and many of you may remember uh, sitting in uh, this room in this building uh, when it was the Dennison building. Um, so let me introduce our speaker now. <laughs> um, but first I want to note that uh, we will have a question and answer period at the end. And if uh, those online and even in the room would like to send their questions by email to physics at umich.edu, uh, we'll get to as many as we can. So Professor Aaron Pierce, he's a theor theoretical physicist. He grew up in Cleveland and he studied at Rice University and uh, the University of California at Berkeley receiving his PhD in 2002. After postdoctoral positions at uh, Stanford, Linear Accelerator Center, and Harvard, we were extremely fortunate to bring Aaron here to the University of Michigan to join the faculty in 2006. Aaron has and continues to be exceptionally productive, addressing crucial questions relating to dark matter, the origin of matter, and understanding how gravity fits into particle physics. In 2013, he became the founding director of the University of Michigan Lineweber Center for Theoretical Physics, and he continued until his sabbatical in 2020. Uh, in addition to all this, he's a wonderful colleague and a scholar, as you will soon see, and his lecture is entitled The History and the Mystery of Spin. Aaron? All right, thank you so much. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here talking to you on this uh, occasion. Uh, as you heard from Tim already, uh, Homer was fascinated by subatomic spin. Uh, this is something I know he was starting with his PhD uh, and going on to the very end of his career, he was uh, always curious about. And one of the things that I want to impart to you today is why this is such a fascinating subject and hopefully you'll be fascinated by it by the end of my talk today. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, get you excited about it by telling you three stories. And one of the things that's exciting is all three of these stories relate to the physics at the University of Michigan. So the first of these stories is the story of the electron spin. And the main physics take home from that is that electrons act like tiny little magnets. And so I want to explain how it is that we know that and a little bit about the story of the discovery, which is actually pretty fascinating. Uh, the second thing is I want to tell a story about something called G minus 2. And put in simple terms, it's basically how big exactly are these tiny little magnets. And it turns out by measuring exactly how big these magnets are, we can learn some really fundamental things about how nature works. Uh, in passing, I want to comment on this picture on the right here. This is a sculpture which is entitled G minus 2, which was actually created by one of our faculty, Jan Zorn. And it sits in the courtyard, which is now nestled between Randall Lab, West Hall, and Homer A. Neal Laboratory. So uh, I encourage you to go over and take a look at it after my talk, if you like, and you can try to figure out why it's called G minus 2. All right. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Large Hadron Collider, which, of course, uh, Dr. Neal was uh, a leader in. And I want to talk about uh, one of the seminal discoveries of the Large Hadron Collider, the Higgs boson. And surprisingly, the Higgs boson isn't a tiny little magnet, or maybe not surprisingly, but it's not a tiny little magnet, and I want to talk a little bit about what lessons we can learn from that. So those are the three stories I want to tell you today. And uh, Professor Neal has made it easy for me to tell you about the first story, because he is the Samuel Gouchmitt Dis Distinguished University Professor of Physics. And at the University of Michigan, when you've distinguished yourself as a scholar, one of the awards that you can get is to become a collegiate professor. And you get to choose who you want your collegiate professor to be named after. You become the so-and-so professor of physics. And Dr. Neal chose the Samuel Gouchmitt professor of physics because he was so fascinated with spin. And Dr. Gouchmitt is a key player in this first story that I'm going to be telling you. So George Ullenbeck and Sam Gouchmitt were graduate students in the Netherlands. And they were responsible for the discovery of electron spin. And that's the first story that I want to tell you about. They then came to the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Ullenbeck was here from 1927 off and on until 1960. Uh, there was a short break in the late 30s where he went briefly back to the Netherlands, and a short break in the 40s when he was actually at MIT working at the Rad Lab uh, working on radar during World War II. Uh, 
Dr. Gauchmidt was here from 1927 to 1946, and then he later went on to uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. Another thing I wanted to mention in passing uh, is that Professor Uhlenbeck was served as president of the American Physical Society in 1954, which is a position that Professor Neal uh, held uh, sometime in the last decade as well. All right, so plenty of connections to, 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 to Homer. So these gentlemen were uh, discoverers of the electron spin. And to try and understand something about the electron spin, we have to go all the way back uh, to Niels Bohr, who is responsible for one of the first quantum models of the atom. And he had three postulates that helped us understand the structure of the atom. So this is a somewhat primitive model of the atom by today's standards, but we're still a lot to be learned from it, and we can, uh, it'll help us understand the electron spin. So there are three postulates, the first of which says that electrons move in what are called stationary orbits without radiating. And this was uh, an important postulate because normally when we think about a charge that is accelerating, we think about that giving off radiation. This is the principle by which radio stations work, for example. Um, and so electrons can just sit in those orbits and they, they remain stable. That's thing number one. The second thing is that the orbits are determined by saying that the amount of angular momentum in one of those orbits is forced to be an integer multiple of a, a fundamental constant called h bar. So you can't just be at any orbit you want. There are very specific orbits that nature has chosen, and it's in terms of this fundamental constant called h bar. It's Planck's constant. The third thing is that photons are emitted in jumps between these orbits. So let's see if I can get this pointer to work for me. So Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. So if I start off in, uh, I think we're going to skip it. So if I start off in uh, this sort of this n equals 3 orbit, I could jump down to an orbit of lower energy, and in that process, I'll emit a photon. And that photon has some characteristic frequency, or equivalently, uh, a special color. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between frequency and color. And the colors of photons that are emitted uh, from an atom are determined by those energy levels, those spacings. So if I were to look at hydrogen, there's a series of colors that can be emitted, and these show up as discrete lines in, uh, in spectra, and each one of these lines corresponds to the jump between different levels in the atom. All right, so the take-home messages here is we got jumps between levels in the atoms. Each of those corresponds to a photon of a particular color. All right, so the next thing we need to know to try and understand the discovery of electron spin is that loops of current are bar magnets. So if I take a loop of current, so I have charge going around in a circle, that is equivalent to a little bar magnet. So something with a little tiny pole, north pole and a south pole. So I'm going to demonstrate that for you very quickly with this apparatus we have over here. So here is a loop of current. It's on, OK? And, but right now, I haven't closed the switch, and so there's no current running through. And so if I slide this bar magnet through, nothing happens. It just goes right through. On the other hand, if I close that loop, you can see that it's getting sucked in because this is acting like a bar magnet. And it's getting pulled back and forth because of the north and south pole of that magnet that's sitting there because of the current that's running through this loop. So a loop of current acts like a tiny little bar magnet. All right, so what does this have to do with atoms? Well, this has to do with atoms is that electrons are running around in a loop. Let's actually, electrons are running around in a loop. So if I have that atom that's going around in a circle, electron that's going around in a circle around a proton, that's going to carry charge. And so that's effectively a current. And so that means there's a current. That means that there is a magnet associated with that motion of that electron. Okay? And so now we need to talk about what the effect of that magnet is going to be on those splittings. And once we affect the splittings of those energy levels, it's going to affect the photons that we see. So if we put an, an atom in a magnetic field, what's going to happen? So I'm going to have an atom sitting there, and I'm going to apply a magnetic field to it. So now there's one magnet, which is that electron running around. And there's the other magnet that I'm applying to the outside of the atom. And what's going to happen? Well, we know what happens when you put one magnet in a magnetic field, because you guys all know how compasses work. You take that compass needle, tries to align itself with the magnetic field. It likes to be aligned with that external magnetic field. So what does likes to mean here? 
Well, likes to means that it's the state of lowest energy. So nature loves to be in the state of lowest energy. A ball rolls down a hill. So you're in a state of lower energy when that magnet aligns itself with the external magnetic field. So that compass needle aligns itself with the magnetic field of the Earth, and that's the state of the lowest energy of that system. So there is take home message here is that there is an energy associated with the interaction of that little magnet of the electron running around and if I apply an external magnetic field to an atom. And so depending on how that little magnet is oriented relative to my external magnetic field, that atom is going to be at a higher or lower energy state. And this is the origin of something called the Zeeman effect. So the Zeeman effect says that if I started off with having some characteristic energy splitting, and then I apply an external magnetic field, this is called magnetic fields B, B as in magnet, of course, um, then it ends up splitting the energy levels, and you can see a variety of different energies taking you between what before there was only one energy splitting. So the result of that is that you can start with one spectral line, and that one spectral line gets split into many. Because you can have not just one transition, but now many in the presence of that magnetic field. Because you've affected the energies of the atom due to the presence of that external magnetic field. Now, that's the Zeeman effect. And that, everything I've described to you is reasonably well understood. But there is also something called the anomalous Zeeman effect, which is when people looked at the energy spectra of atoms, the, and the colors of the photons that were emitted from atoms, there were too many lines. And they weren't in the right place. And physicists couldn't understand why it was that the energy splittings were what they were. So they took the picture that I just described to you of an electron running around an atom and putting it in a magnetic field and asked, what should the, the, the colors of light be? And they found that they were not correct and there were too many different colors. And that's where Gauschmidt and Uhlenbeck entered the picture. So uh, I just wanted to have a quote to emphasize how per perturbed physicists were. So this is Pauli. Some of you might know the name Pauli. Uh, he's a very famous physicist. Uh, you might have heard about him in your high school chemistry class from something called the Pauli exclusion principle. No two electrons can say have the same address is the way my high school chemistry teacher always saw it. Um, and he looks like someone who couldn't be happy. Uh, how could someone be happy when you're thinking about the anomalous Zeeman effect? So people were very troubled by this. And the insight of Gauchmann and Uhlenbeck was that uh, you could think about the spin, and now spin enters the picture, you could think about the spin of the electron, an electron spinning on its axis, could also act as a magnet too. So uh, it turns out that this sort of semi-classical picture where we think about things very mechanistically is maybe not quite right, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. But uh, for, the, for the moment, let's think about one as the Earth going around the sun and the other one about the Earth rotating on its axis. And so we know about the Earth going around the sun or the electron going around the atom. We already talked about that bar magnet. And now there's another one where I have a spinning little bit of charge. And that spinning little bit of charge is another bar magnet. And so now there's two bar magnets in the picture, both of which that can interact with an external magnetic field. And there's going to be some energy associated with the magnetic field interacting with bar magnet number one and some energy associated with the external field acting with bar magnet number two. And those two things taken together are what's going to explain the anomalous Zeeman effect. Now, the next figure in our story is Paul Ehrenfest. Paul Ehrenfest is, in his own right, a very famous physicist. When I teach quantum mechanics, one of the things I teach my students is something called Ehrenfest theorem, which helps provide a bridge between the classical and the quantum world. But in our story, we're not going to talk about his work. We're going to talk about his role as a mentor to Gauchmidt and Uhlenbeck. Um, and I know Homer would approve of how supportive he was because Homer was always very supportive to young people. So uh, Gauchmidt and Uhlenbeck had this idea about electron spin. And I wanted to learn more about this. And it turns out there's the Bentley Historical Library, which is located on North Campus. If you have never been there, it's an amazing resource. It has boxes and boxes of papers of Gauchmidt and Uhlenbeck. And it was one of my great treats in preparing for this talk to go back and look at some of those papers. And uh, one of the things that I found is letters that were written from Elsa Uhlenbeck, who is uh, George Uhlenbeck's wife, to Esther Gauchmidt, who is Sam 
uh, Gautschmidt's daughter. And they carried on a correspondence throughout their life. And this letter was about the story of the discovery of the electron spin. Um, by the way, I wanted to find letters from Uhlenbeck to Gautschmidt, but they were all written in Dutch. And I didn't have time to translate them before this talk, but maybe chat GPT can help me later. OK, so, um, but in this letter, which I'm not going to try and make you read the cursive, um, they had approached Ehrenfest with their idea. And Ehrenfest said, just write it down. And he kept it for some time, and they asked for it back. And one of the reasons they asked for it back is they had thought about it in this semi-classical way that I described to you, of just a ball of spinning charge. And they realized the amount of spin, or how quickly the electron would have to be spinning at its equator, would have been faster than the speed of light. And they got very embarrassed about that. I think they had even talked to Lorentz at some point, who is a giant in the field of uh, relativity. And they thought, oh, this is nuts. We're very embarrassed to have thought about this. And uh, Aaron Fest said, it's OK. You're young enough to have a forgivable stupidity. You should publish it. It got published in Nature and uh, it became a great discovery. And the other thing I love about this letter is they say, if you hear George, Sam's done it mostly. And if you hear Sam, he says George did it all. But they both agreed that Aaron Fest just had a good idea that they should talk to each other. And it was, it was really great because they had completely different strengths. And it's a really a case where a mentor made a difference in, in these young people's lives. And so as I said, what's going on here is there are now two bar magnets in the picture, the bar magnets of the electron's orbit, the bar magnet of the electron's spin. And the relative orientation of these magnets and their interaction with that external magnetic field leads to the complexity of the spectral lines and the colors of the photons that we can see in the anomalous Zeeman effect. So you can go from a relatively simple picture to a relatively complex picture. And this agreement is uh, quantitatively correct. And that's how we know that the electron has spin. Uh, one more point on the importance of having supportive mentors. Um, this is a letter from Thomas. For those, I see saw some grad students here. Those of you who know about Thomas Procession, it's that Thomas. Um, he wrote a letter to Gaudschmidt saying, I think you're very lucky to have get your spinning electron published and talked about it before Pauli heard of it. So we saw Pauli earlier, this cheerful looking gentleman. And it turns out that more than a year ago, Kronig, and this was more than a year ago, was about the same time as Gaudschmidt and Uhlenbeck published their work, I think about a month before. Uh, Kronig believed in something called like a spinning electron and worked out something, maybe not quite all of the details yet. And the first person he showed it to was Pauli. Pauli ridiculed the whole thing so much that the first person became also the last, and no one heard anything of it. Which all goes to show you that the infallibility of the deity does not extend to a self-styled vicar on Earth. <laughs> so there you are. Um, so it's very lucky that Ehrenfest was in the picture for Gauchman and Ulebeck and uh, not Pauli. OK, so um, and I, I wanted to impress on you how important this idea of electron spin. So I mentioned already the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, and the idea of electron spin is absolutely crucial to everything in chemistry, for example. So if you look at the periodic table, in that very first line, you see hydrogen and helium. And the reason there are two things in that first line is in the lowest orbital of the atom, you can fit in one, two electrons with one spin up and one spin down. And in the next line, nominally, if there were not uh, electron spin, there would be four slots to put those electrons. But since they can have two spins, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so the structure of chemistry is intimately tied to electron spin. So spin is absolutely crucial uh, for, for understanding chemistry. So when I talk about electron spin, I, I can't resist showing the stern gerlach experiment. This is how I teach a lot of electron spin in, when I teach quantum mechanics. Um, I think it's maybe uh, a way that's easier to visually to see what's going on. So I want to uh, just give you a second way to understand electron spin other than these spectral lines, if you found that a little bit abstract. So in the cern gerlach experiment, uh, and interestingly, by the way, of a historical footnote, this experiment was actually done prior to the whole Gauchmidt and Uhlenbeck story. But it was misinterpreted in terms of the little orbital bar magnets that we talked about. People didn't understand what we were actually observing here was the electron spin bar magnet. And much later, well, not a few years later, people finally realized the correct interpretation of the experiment in terms of electron spin. So 
the way this experiment works is that here you have an uh, oven of atoms, and these atoms get uh, collimated into a beam, and they're shot through a bar magnet. And this bar magnet has a north pole and a south pole. And these lines here are supposed to help you understand that the magnetic field is stronger here than it is here. And so if I send a bar magnet, an electron spin is a good one. If I send a spinning electron through here, then the bar magnet will get pulled. The south pole goes towards the north pole. So that would like to pull me up, right? And the north pole would like to go towards the south pole at the bottom. So that's going to pull me down. So if those poles were the same, the bar magnet goes nowhere, right? Those two poles would balance. But since the magnetic field is stronger here than it is here, that means that the pull on the top is a little bigger than the pull on the bottom. And so that thing is going to get pulled up. And on, conversely, if I oriented the bar magnet down in the, in the opposite orientation, it would get pulled down. On the other hand, if I, if I have the bar magnet in this orientation, then the, I wouldn't expect the magnet to get pulled at all. It would just go through unimpeded. So I have a short little video here, which I hope will work, um, that is first going to show us exactly what I said in words. So uh, we're going to have this stern gerlach setup. They have this magnetic field with a non-zero gradient in it. And we're going to start shooting bar magnets through it. And you shoot the bar magnets through in one orientation. No surprise. They just go ahead and go up. And if I shoot them through with the opposite orientation, then they're going to, oh, if I shoot them, sorry, if I, with uh, horizontal, they go through. In the opposite orientation, they go down. But of course, I can imagine them with any orientation in between. And then they would end up making a nice line right, from top to bottom, the ones that were oriented upwards and the ones that are oriented downward and everything in between. But that's not what happens in the quantum world. So what happens with quantum spin is you send atoms through, they go up, or they go down. They go up, or they go down. They don't do anything in between. And uh, that observation and the results, so these are all had one particular spin. These all had the opposite spin. And this sort of discrete nature of spin uh, is what corresponds to the fact that we still saw discrete lines in that Zeeman effect. So you might have said, oh, you talked to me about bar magnets. And you said, depending on the orientation of the bar magnet, there was different amounts of energy. So you might have thought, I could have gotten energy, any energy possible. And so the lines would have been all over the place. But that's not the case. There are still only discrete options. And that's why we see discrete lines uh, when we think about the Zeeman effect. All right. So uh, I just wanted to make a comment before we leave the world of electron spin that this simple two-state system uh, that's described for like spin up and spin down of the electron is the fundamental building block of many of the quantum technologies and quantum information science that we hear about today. It's really the foundation of quantum computing. And actually, the Nobel Prize this year uh, was looking, I guess, specifically at photons. But it was basically systems that describe, are described by almost exactly the same mathematics as that electron spin system. So uh, this is not just of historical interest, something that happened 100 years ago. This is still something that's having an impact today. All right. So, um, because I said there was this connection between Homer and uh, Professor Gauchmidt, I wanted to just comment a little bit more on Professor Gauchmidt. He was a very interesting character. Um, right near the end of his time at the University of Michigan, he served in what was called the Alsos mission. Um, Alsos is Greek for grove. Um, and I don't know if any of you know who is in charge of the uh, nuclear program, the general in charge of the nuclear program in this country in World War II, his name was General Groves. And so I guess if there were classicists in Nazi Germany, they would have broken that code. Um, but maybe not the best code. But uh, the Alsos mission, what they were meant to do was to go to Europe. Uh, and they, they landed with a military attachment. And their job was to try and figure out what did the Nazis know about building atomic bombs. And the military realized that we don't necessarily have the technical know-how about who are the right physicists to talk to in Germany. 
or to look what experiments we should be looking for. And so they needed to have a scientific head of this mission, and Samuel Gouchman was the head of that mission. And he's written a book called Alsos, which is the book that I've shown here, which is absolutely fascinating uh, read. So I encourage you, uh, if you have any interest in this kind of history, to, to, to go and read it. Um, he also served as the editor of the Physical Review starting in 1951 and launched Physical Review Letters, which is perhaps the premier uh, physics journal. Um, he had a very funny comment that appeared in his obituary. Um, it's a joke he liked to tell. Uh, simple extrapolation shows by the year 2000, the speed of, speed of growth of physical review on the shelf will exceed the velocity of light. But this one contracts special relativity because by then the information transfer would be zero. <laughs> so he had a very wry sense of humor. Um, I could tell you, you could ask me about it later. Uh, while I was reading those archives on the Bentley Library, I found lots of examples of Gauchmitt's sense of humor, which I think Homer would have appreciated. All right, so that ends my first story, the electron spin. So now we're going to move on to my second story, uh, which goes again by the name of G minus two, and what you should be thinking in your head is how exactly big are these tiny little magnets? So I have this fancy equation, uh, and you don't need to know any of the details of the equation, except for the fact that the thing on the left-hand side is telling me how big my bar magnet is. And the, big, the, the, the size of my bar magnet is proportional to a bunch of stuff, including how much spin I have. And one of the bunch of stuff, so this stuff is like the charge and the mass of the electron and the speed of light, so these are all fundamental constants. And then there's one magic number in here, which is g. And that's the g of g minus 2, which we're going to talk about in just a second. But before we talk about uh, g minus 2, I want to say that one of the lessons that we've learned from our discussions in the Zeeman effect is that spin is part of what it means to be an electron. So just like we say electron has a charge, it has negative charge, and we, we think that that charge is stapled onto an electron. That is what it means to be an electron. So too is spin. Spin is something that is stapled onto the electron, and that is part of what it means to be an electron. And so that's a fundamental quantity that every electron has. And associated with every single electron is also a certain size of bar magnet, which is determined by this number, g. Okay, So that's the thing that's going to be the star of the next part of the story. This is part of what it means to be an electron. And uh, Paul Dirac was one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. And he really was one of the people who started on the path of, disc of combining spin with quantum mechanics and also special relativity. And the language which we now use to talk about the combination of quantum mechanics and special relativity is something called quantum field theory, which I'll mention a few additional times later in this talk. And when Dirac applied these ideas to the electron, one of the things that he famously predicted was antimatter, uh, the positron. But also, one of the things that came out of something that is now known as the Dirac equation was a prediction for the size of that electron bar magnet. And he said, I know how big it is, that magic number g, it's 2. It's 2, and you can go measure the strength of that electron. And it was actually part of getting that calculation of the Zeeman effect and everything else relies a little bit on that g being exactly 2. So that was consistent with the Rack's equation. Now, once you apply quantum field theory to the picture, we know that, G, that 2 is not exactly right. So these little cartoons that I've drawn here are called Feynman diagrams. And these are a tool that theorists such as myself can use to calculate uh, using quantum field theory. So hidden behind these things are uh, scary math. And, and this one is Dirac's. So he says, there's, I know something about the interaction of electrons with photons. And remember, photons are particles that are associated with electromagnetism. and so. <clears throat> this little cartoon is telling me something about how electrons interact with magnetic fields, and the result of this cartoon is that G is 2. Now, Feynman and Schwinger and Tonegawa were three theorists who uh, helped develop uh, quantum electrodynamics, which is the quantum field theory associated with the interaction of light and matter, electrons and photons, and they taught us how to go further than this simple interaction, but how to calculate, instead, more detailed interactions. So if I were to think about breaking this picture down into little pieces, there's an interaction here between an electron and a photon. 
and an electron and a photon, and an electron and a photon. And the combination of all those electrons, if I forgot about what was happening in the middle, looks like an electron interacting with the photon. And it turns out when you put this diagram together, it basically acts as a correction to this effective vertex of the electron interacting with the photon. So electron interacting with the photon receives a correction from that cartoon and the mathematics underneath it. And it turns out that the correction says that this thing is 2 plus a little number, which is alpha over pi. Alpha is a fundamental constant, which has value roughly 1 over 137. It's called the fine structure constant. And Julian Schwinger, as I mentioned, was one of the people who was responsible for developing this theory of quantum electrodynamics. And he was one of the first people to calculate it. And he actually calculated basically g divided by 2. And so that's why it says alpha over 2 pi rather than alpha over pi on his tombstone. He was so proud of this calculation, he had it on his tombstone. Um, and he didn't get it wrong by a factor of 2. He was correct. It was just he was calculating this thing divided by 2. Um, and I knew this tri piece of trivia that he was so proud of this calculation that he put it on his tombstone. And so I said, oh, that would be great to put in my talk. Uh, I'm going to go to Google Images and find a picture of it. And so I went to Google Images, and I found this picture. And then I said, oh, you know, I want to give credit to the photographer. Who is the photographer for this picture? And it turns out that the photographer of this picture is uh, someone by the name of Jacob Bergeli. And uh, some of the professors here will know Jacob Bergeli. Jacob Bergeli was an extraordinarily bright undergraduate here. He was an undergraduate just before I arrived, actually. And uh, I was delighted that he took this picture because that allows me to talk about something that Homer did. Uh, so Homer impacted the lives of many, many students uh, in many, many different ways. And, but one of the ways that I know he was especially proud of was that he helped young people get involved in research. And he was instrumental in developing this program where we were able to send students from the University of Michigan to spend summers at CERN, uh, the laboratory with the Large Hadron Collider, and experience firsthand cutting edge research uh, with uh, these leading scientists. And you know, when, when Homer was asked about it, this is what he had to say about it. It broadens the horizons scientifically and culturally, helps the United States train the next generation of its scientific leaders. And Jacob Bergeli was an alumnus of this particular program. And so uh, he is now a professor at uh, Penn State University. So uh, I know uh, Jake was inspired by his time in this program. And uh, I, I think Homer would have been delighted that I came across this, this photo of Jake's while, while preparing this talk. All right, so, uh, so again, what we've learned here is that the size of the bar magnet, the size of that spinning electron, is not 2. It's 2 plus a tiny bit. Okay, And to get to that tiny bit, we had to do a fancy calculation using quantum field theory. And it turns out that if we're really strong, we could do even fancier calculations. So we could work really hard and Instead of having that picture that I had here, I could draw more complicated pictures. And each one of these is harder to calculate than the next. And it turns out that the first one we said was this number was basically 1. But then you could calculate, if you're stronger, calculate the next one. And then there's a more complicated picture, which is the next one. And remember, uh, each one of these terms is smaller than the previous, because this alpha is 1 over 137, roughly. And so this thing is roughly a uh, sub percent correction. But this thing is going to be more than 100 times smaller than that one. This thing is going to be 100 times smaller than that one. This thing is 100 times smaller than that one. So even though doing an exact calculation in quantum field theory is essentially possible, doing this sort of approximate calculation where you can calculate a correction, and then the correction to the correction, and then the correction to the correction is possible, but really hard. So uh, you could do these calculations, and then you can get a prediction for the size of that bar magnet. And then you can try to measure the size of that bar magnet. And if your prediction for the size of the bar magnet and the measurement of the size of the bar magnet agree, that's a fantastic test of quantum field theory and tells us that we understand something about the theory of electrons and photons. Uh, and so now uh, Dick Crane enters. So Dick Crane was another professor here at the University of Michigan. 
Uh, he was a professor from 1938 to 1978, uh, actively an emeritus from 1978 to 2007. If any of you have been to the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, uh, he was instrumental in developing many of the exhibits there as well. Uh, and when I was looking for a photo of Dick Crane, uh, I again found something great. Uh, so I uh, did a Google image search for Dick Crane, and I found uh, this photo, which is on a website by Jens Zorn, who's uh, collected something about the history of uh, many interesting pieces of history in the Minnesota Physics Department. And this is the picture that he had of Dick Crane at his home with his amateur radio station uh, in 1920. So this is well before he came uh, to Michigan. He's a, a young, young man at this time. And uh, I love it because Homer Neal also was a big fan of uh, radio. And uh, he had uh, this nice quote talking about the importance of uh, radio to him. Uh, he witnessed the excitement and liberation associated with the hobby of amateur radio. No matter the constraints that were placed upon me by the conditions of my environment, the world was literally open to me through the wonders of worldwide wireless communication using inexpensive equipment I had built myself. <clears throat> this was undoubtedly the key to my lifelong interest in science. And I think it was the key for many people. Um, I was talking to Professor Gerdes, uh, and he was saying many people of Homer's generation either had a chemistry set or a ham radio. Um, <clears throat> but I also found this interesting reading this about Homer because I know that uh, throughout his career, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later, he was very interested in developing communication tools among scientists and helping them collaborate more effectively with one another. And I, and I thought about whether or not maybe his, uh, his desire to have effective communication might have been influenced with his experience with radio as a young man. All right, so it's time for me for time for another demo. So this demo is going to be trying to teach us something about that G minus 2 experiment. So remember the G minus 2 experiment, is, its goal is to try and teach us something about uh, how big that tiny bar magnet on the electron is, right? So remember the number in front of the spin was G. And the bigger G is, the bigger your bar magnet is. And so we're going to try and measure that number. And if we can measure that number precisely, I told you, that tells us something about the details of quantum field theory. And so the way that this gets measured, our key ingredient, and so I'm going to, remember, I'm a theorist, so take pity on me. All right, so it's on. That's the first step. I'm already ahead of the game. OK, so now we've got a little electron, and it's spinning. and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on this magnetic field. And you can see what happens is that spin processes. Right? So this is just like a top. I could show you with this bicycle wheel, too. You give it a spin. And in the case of a top, the, uh, the gravitational field of the Earth causes that spin to process around its axis. And now if I have a charged particle and I apply a magnetic field to it, or if I have a magnet, if I have a little magnet and I apply a magnetic field to it, it causes that spin to process. And that's the key idea behind these G minus 2 experiments, is you take your tiny little particle, the electron, that spinning electron, you place it in a magnetic field. And here, just for fun, I'll switch the direction of the magnetic field. And you can see it getting pushed the opposite way. So the force provided by that external magnetic field provides a torque on the system, and it causes that spin to process. And so that's going to be a key idea behind these experiments. All right, success. All right. So now, that's how these experiments work. So you, you put your electron in a magnetic field, and you look for, at a difference between uh, the, the way that these experiments are done is you put them in a circulating ring. And there's some frequency associated with that particle going around the ring. That's called the cyclotron frequency. And then there's another frequency associated with the motion that we saw, that precession frequency. And it turns out the difference between those two numbers, the frequency at which the electron goes around and the frequency at which it its spin processes, measures precisely this quantity, g minus 2. And so that was uh, the idea behind, uh, actually, Dick Crane had three generations of experiments. And the second and third generation use precisely this technique. And I think maybe you can already get an idea of why the sculpture looks the way it does. Um, but again, that's the part of your homework to go look at it and, and see if it makes sense. 
Okay, so uh, here's the, the paper from Dick Crane. Uh, this was actually after the result of his third measurement of this quantity. Uh, and the first one, the result was something like 2 plus or minus, uh, I think, 0.01, the first version of this experiment. So it wasn't even sensitive to that alpha over pi correction. And it didn't actually use this technique that I described to you with the measures of the differences in the frequency. But uh, he kept trying and did this experiment in three different versions. And by the third experiment, they had this very impressive looking result. Look at all those decimal places. And uh, so he made this measurement with this tiny little error. And this is not only sensitive to that first correction, but is sensitive to this second correction. And you could see that the theory at the time, so this was in the 60s, was giving this result. Um, and so you were sensitive not just to that first diagram that Schwinger calculated, but the next more complicated version. So again, uh, a precise test of, of quantum field theory. Incidentally, by the way, this other co-author, who is, I believe was a student at the time, is also a very famous physicist. So um, those of you who have maybe been to a Saturday morning physics talk hearing about the cosmic microwave background, the echo of the Big Bang. Uh, one of the experiments that measures that is called WMAP, which is the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. And it's named after this gentleman who went on to a very successful career at uh, Princeton and elsewhere. OK, so it didn't stop with uh, Dick Crane. This experiment is, this measurement is still being done on the electron. Uh, I, first, I found the number from 2008. And here was the theory. And here was the experiment. And so you can see they've added a few decimal places. Of, and this is really amazing. I mean, this is just an incredible test of the uh, quantum field theory of, and the interactions between uh, electrons and photons. And then, while I was preparing this talk, I realized, you know what? There was a paper that just came out uh, about a month and a half ago by a professor at Northwestern that measured this even more precisely. And the, it's measured with subpart per trillion uh, accuracy. There are not many things in this universe we measure with accuracy better than one part per trillion. And now it is so precise that this actually measures alpha. So normally I said, oh, we plug in something that's about 137 here and then we make a prediction. Now this prediction and measurement is so precise that you turn it around and you measure this quantity and you take the theory and you turn it around and that's a measurement of alpha. So now you, if you want to make a test, you have to go measure alpha somewhere else better and better to, to make a non-trivial test. So this is uh, something that started uh, you know, 50 years ago, and, or 60 years ago, and is, is still going on. All right, so uh, I, I also want to mention another way in which this is still proceeding. So this is my, this is, I use this every time I give a public talk on particles. Uh, so these are, this is from particlezoo.net. You can buy these plushies online. Um, they're very cute little uh, plush toys. And this is the standard model of particle physics. So we've already talked a lot about the electron. Um, and we know that the proton is made of up and down quarks. And there are more exotic quarks that you can uh, make at particle accelerators. In fact, um, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about those later. But the thing I want to mention first is the muon. And the muon is basically a, like a heavy cousin of the electron. So it interacts with photons in much the same way that an electron does. It's a negatively charged object. It's about 200 times heavier. It does have a rather annoying habit of decaying uh, into electrons and neutrinos if you wait about a microsecond. So if you want to do an experiment on it, you got to do it fast. Um, but uh, those experiments are ongoing. And in fact, you can also measure the g minus 2, the size of that bar magnet for the muon. So just like we talked about the electron, and it has some characteristic bar magnet, the muon also has some characteristic bar magnet. And that's something that actually Tim Chupp is involved in. And so this is an experiment that's going on at Fermilab. And here's the ring at which these muons circulate. One of the things that's really helpful is that special relativity says that if you get your muons going faster than close to the speed of light, not faster than the speed of light, God forbid, if you get them going close to the speed of light, then you get a time dilation factor that makes them live a little bit longer. So, uh, so you put these muons in a ring, and they go around with that cyclotron frequency we talked about. They have a characteristic frequency going around, and they have a characteristic spin precession frequency. And it turns out by measuring the decay products of the muon, you could figure out something about their spin when they decayed. 
And you can use that to try and measure how much precession they had. And then you can try to use that to measure the strength of that bar magnet for the muon. And so this is, again, something that's happening now. And they released a result just a couple of years ago. And I think, actually, Professor Chupp has given a Saturday morning physics on this. Um, and you could easily give a whole an hour-long lecture on this for sure. Um, so I'm not doing it the justice it, 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 it deserves. But uh, there was a measurement in 2006. And you can read, think about this as the, something like the size of the bar magnet measured with some big pedestal subtracted off. And that was done at Brookhaven. And they saw, found this. And Fermilab result is here. And you could average those two results, and you get this. And the Fermilab result is uh, data is ongoing. Their error bar will get smaller. And there's a theory prediction. And the theory prediction, which was a bunch of theorists got together and said, this is the best thing we think at the moment. This is what they predicted, was over here. And you will notice that this thing with its error bars does not overlap this thing. And uh, there was already a discrepancy here to here, for sure. Uh, but the new data sharpens that discrepancy because it tells us that there's now another experiment that got the same result as this one. And so uh, that's an active question, is where this number is going to settle down experimentally, but also how to interpret the discrepancy between this observed value and this experimental measurement. So I said I made a big deal about how well things agreed for the electron case. And now there's a parent puzzle here for the muon case. And so that's something that's actually very exciting. Physicists get very excited when there's puzzles and discrepancies. That's something to explain. OK, so I showed you this picture a second ago with uh, all of our friends, the quarks and the electrons and the muons and the neutrinos. Uh, I also wanted to, to mention the top quark very briefly. Homer was also involved uh, experiment, experiment also at Fermilab, uh, the D0 experiment, which was one of two experiments, D0 and CDF, that were instrumental in the discovery of the top quark in uh, 1995, which uh, was right around the time that I was going off to university and starting to learn about all these exciting things. All right, so <clears throat> the, all of these guys, it turns out, all of the stuff, electrons, quarks, all of these guys have what we call spin one half now. Spin one half basically means it's the cases that have two objects, two options, spin up and spin down, like we saw in that stern gerlach experiment. So everybody that makes up stuff is spin one half. That's part of what we know to be true in the standard model of particle physics. It turns out that all of the force carriers, like the photon and the gluon, which uh, Professor Chupp mentioned, that helps hold together those quarks inside the proton. And then also these particles called the W and the Z, which are responsible for something called the weak interaction. All of those guys uh, are spin one. Spin one is typically means, in the case where you're um, massive, like the W and Z, that there are actually three options for your spin uh, rather than two. So these guys differ in an important way, and their behavior is very different at the quantum level because of that spin. And uh, so, but again, it's really part of their identity. So if I give you an electron, it has something stapled to it that says, I have a spin, my spin is 1 half. And if I give you a W boson, it says, I have a spin, my spin is spin 1. So this notion of spin is absolutely something essential to the identity of subatomic particles. Um, another thing I guess I wanted to comment on, which brings me to my third topic, is the Higgs boson. And as we'll see, the Higgs boson uh, is going to be responsible for resolving a number of puzzles, one of which is the photon, which is the particle we've talked about at some length, which is responsible for electricity and magnetism, is massless. And that's what allows it to propagate forces over very long distances. The W and the Z, which are responsible for the weak force, those operate only on very short distances. And that is, in part, a signal of the fact that the W and Z are very heavy. The W weighs about the 80 proton masses. Uh, the Z weighs about 90. And these are fundamental particles. We, there are no substructure associated with these guys, but they weigh 90 times the mass of a proton. So these are very heavy. And the incredibly different difference in the behavior between electromagnetism and the weak force is in no small part due to the difference in the masses of these particles. 
And that's where the Higgs boson comes into play. And Homer was part of the Atlas collaboration. And uh, the Atlas collaboration was truly a uh, worldwide endeavor with all of these countries that I've highlighted in blue uh, participating. And this is, I think, only a snapshot of the collaboration. Uh, I think there's maybe 6,000 physicists associated with this collaboration. As many as, I think, 2,600 authors appear on their papers. Um, it's, it's really a worldwide effort. And uh, as I said, Homer, one of his big focuses was thinking about tools to help all of these people collaborate effectively uh, with one another. And the other thing I, I, I just wanted to mention is that Homer was absolutely instrumental in getting the University of Michigan involved in this collaboration. Uh, one thing that uh, came up again and again yesterday, we had a symposium yesterday talking about some of Homer's contributions to physics. Uh, over and over, the, the word uh, vision or visionary was used in, in, in context uh, in describing Homer. And he had the vision to get Michigan involved in this experiment, which has made absolutely fundamental discoveries. And also, he had the vision to be thinking about these collaborative tools. I mean, how, how are people going to be collaborating with physicists in Geneva if they're teaching at their home institution in Ann Arbor? How are you going to be effective to collaborate across those distances? You know, today, everyone's on Zoom all the time. Homer was thinking about these things 20 years ago. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing to me. I mean, every lecture, this is being captured on video. Almost all of my lectures that I now give are being captured. Homer thought deeply about ways to have effective lecture capture, again, 10, 20 years ago. Um, so, all right, so that's an aside. But back, back to the, uh, Higgs, the story of the Higgs boson. So Atlas, uh, as I said, has a huge presence from University of Michigan. Uh, Homer was instrumental in getting Michigan involved. Uh, these physicists here are also intimately involved in Atlas. Um, there are other people who have been involved in Atlas and have since moved on to other experiments or have retired. Um, but the University of Michigan remains, I believe, the largest university group in the United States uh, working on the Atlas experiment. So what is the function of the Higgs boson? So I showed you a picture with all of these little characters of the standard model. And uh, I said that one of the puzzles was that the W and the Z were massive while the photon remained massless. And it turns out that understanding why it is that the W and the Z are massive and the photon remains massless is the province of the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson, we believe, is also responsible for the mass of particles like the electron. And without the electron mass, there would be no such thing as an atom. So the electron would not be in a stable orbit, and you and I would not be here. So you should be give thanks to the uh, Higgs boson. And uh, this is a little cartoon that was uh, I had commissioned actually by David Zinn, who some of you may know, he leaves wonderful chalk drawings uh, around Ann Arbor. And uh, I had an exhibit over at the old uh, Ruthven Museum describing the physics of the Higgs boson. And he, he made this and some other awesome drawings helped me to explain uh, the Higgs boson. Um, and so the Higgs boson also gives mass for the, to the top quark. And in fact, the top quark is uh, the heaviest of all of these fundamental particles that I've seen here. And so it inter interacts absolutely uh, the most strongly with the Higgs boson of all of the uh, particles that we know of so far. So uh, the Higgs boson was discovered. As I said, it was, it was the missing piece of the standard model. Without it, the standard model tends to give a number of nonsensical predictions. And if you give me another Saturday morning physics, uh, in fact, I've talked about this sometime. I'd be happy to go into more detail about that. But uh, this is the newspaper of the New York Times the day after its discovery. I have this saved in my office here. Um, and so I just took a picture of it for this talk. Uh, and you can see the excitement of the physicists. And I think in this picture, this maybe with the back to the camera, may in fact be Peter Higgs, um, who the Higgs boson was named after. And this, I remember very vividly, the press conference was at 4th of July uh, at 9 AM in Europe. And so on my 4th of July day off, I got up at 4 in the morning or 3 in the morning and watched the discovery of the Higgs boson. It was still pretty great. 5th of July is my birthday, by the way. So I wanted to know if I was going to get everything present like that every year, but it turns out no. Um, so, uh, so the next thing I wanted to mention is, again, something that I know that Homer would be uh, 
absolutely excited about. And I know that because in 2009, uh, he gave a talk on the history of spin at Michigan and what he thought about of the future of spin at Michigan. And he talked about precisely this next question. And it was, I think, at the very top of his list of one of the things that he was excited about. So he knew that the Higgs boson was a big target for the LHC. And when you make a Higgs boson, it doesn't just hang out and say, hi, I'm a Higgs boson. Please investigate me all that you wish. Uh, it very rapidly decays. It disintegrates into other particles, among which, for example, are electrons and muons that we've already talked about so far today. So a single Higgs boson can basically disintegrate into two electrons and two muons. And one of the things that you can do is you can try to measure the spin of that Higgs boson. And you can, the way that you do that is you try to measure the direction of all of these decay products. Because it turns out that if a particle has a spin, that protect, uh, picks out a direction in space. And then when you look at the decay products, you can measure the angle of those decay products relative to that angle of spin, that axis that's been picked out by the spin of the particle. And if you have a particle that does not have spin, that means there is no special direction in space. And so things should decay relatively isotropically. And so if you have a Higgs boson and it has no spin, it should decay isotropically. And so that is, was one of the measurements that Homer was very excited about, was to figure out whether or not the Higgs boson had spin or not. And the prediction uh, is that it should not have spin. And Indeed, that is a measurement that has been done now by At the ATLAS experiment, is the ATLAS has looked at the decay products of the Higgs boson and found out that the Higgs boson does not have a little magnet. The Higgs boson is actually does not have spin. So Homer, I don't know if he would have been excited or disappointed, but he was certainly excited about the measurement, even though the Higgs boson does not have spin. But it is actually, interestingly, the fact that it doesn't have spin is, is, is very interesting theoretically because it is the only fundamental spin zero particle we know of. And that picture I showed you, everything else was either spin 1 half or spin 1. And the Higgs boson is unique in that it is spin zero. And so we do know about other spin zero particles. The pion is an example. But they're all made up of something else. So the pion, for example, is made of two quarks. And the quark has spin 1 half, and the antiquark has turns out spin minus 1 half in a pion. And those sort of cancel each other out to give you an object with total spin 0. But that's because you had two spins canceling each other out. And we know that at a deeper level, a pion is made up of other things. But the Higgs boson, as far as we know, is not comprised of anything else. So the Higgs boson and its absence of spin seems like it's very special. And the question is, what do we learn from that? Uh, one possibility is it could be the first of many spin 0 particles. Um, there's a theory known as supersymmetry. Um, Gordy Kane, who has the office next to mine, his name in many ways is synonymous with supersymmetry. I think I saw him in the back. Um, this has been searched for so far at Atlas and has not been found. I know Homer was very interested in searches for supersymmetry. Um, and that's a possibility, is that even though supersymmetry has not yet been found at Atlas, there may be a hint uh, in the future that it could be found. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, excuse me, experimentalists continue to look for. Um, and whether or not it is or not, I think we're going to learn something uh, exciting about the Higgs boson. And I think the, the fact that the Higgs is spin zero uh, is probably the clue to something very interesting. So with that, I would like to uh, wrap up my talk for today. I've told you three different stories, starting with electrons and going to muons and onto the Higgs boson. And I know Homer would have been excited to hear about all three of these things. And again, I know because Homer sometimes talked to me about all of these things. Um, and all of these things are absolutely of fundamental importance. Uh, spin impacts everything from chemistry to nuclear magnetic resonance and MRI imaging. Uh, it's behind the GPS system and the, the atomic clocks that allow GPS to function. Uh, it's not just of academic interest. It's absolutely of fundamental importance for technologies as well. And I know that Homer was very proud of the tradition, the rich tradition that Michigan had in spin physics. And I think he would be very excited uh, to see what would come next. So thank you very much.
Well, thanks so much, Aaron. Wow. So we're going to move to a, a question and answer period. We've gotten some um, questions online, and we'll also take questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to grab this microphone. OK. All right, let's start, um, let's start here. Actually, why is it called spin? It, it, you kind of suggested that these things may or may not actually be spinning. Great, so that's a good question. So especially when we talk about things at the subatomic level. Um, and, I, and I actually told you that it's not really right to think about this as a ball um, because the ball would be rotating the speed of, faster than the speed of light and so uh, why do we call it spin at all? And you know, one of the reasons we call it spin is precisely what I had to say, and I'm sorry for giving you whiplash here, um, is precisely because uh, it interacts in, sorry, I'm looking for the right, this, this way, where the, the little bar magnet acts precisely in the same way that the orbital bar magnet acts. So uh, it behaves in exactly the way some, you would expect it to do if it were to spin. Um, the other reason, which is a little bit more complicated to explain, and I don't know, maybe Professor Chup, you have some other ideas about good ways to explain this too, is if you look at um, the quantum mechanics and the way you can describe the spin of particles when you're doing theories of quantum mechanics, um, it turns out that when you talk about rotations of these systems in space, they be uh, obey the exact same laws as if you were looking at something that were spinning. So it turns out that uh, this thing really behaves as if it has an angular momentum. When you look at the whole system of the orbital, uh, the orbital angular momentum and the spin, it behaves as if it's an angular momentum. And I guess that's the reason that one of the reasons that it, the name spin has stuck with us. It really behaves like an angular momentum. OK. And of course, the magnet. And of course, the, the magnet. Of yeah. course, that they have magnets. Um, so you mentioned that the stern gerlach experiment um, was misinterpreted. Yes. Exactly how was that? OK. That's, yeah, it's a great question. I love talking about that. So thank you for asking. Um, so. Let's, let's go back to our experiment. So, all right, so here's our experiment. So, in, in fact, it's a great story because what happened was they did this experiment and they sent a postcard to Bohr. And they said, Bohr, great news. We have confirmed your prediction. And remember, what Bohr said is Bohr said something about the orbital angular momentum. Bohr said that the orbital angular momentum was only allowed to take on particular values. And so the way that this experiment was interpreted was in the context of orbital angular momentum. What they thought was that they were measuring something about that orbital bar magnet. And Bohr said that there were only particular discrete values that the orbital bar magnet could take on. And so the fact that this experiment saw discrete values was viewed as a confirmation of what I said about Niels Bohr that you are only allowed to sit in these particular orbits with definite orbital angular momentum. And they, that's how this was interpreted, was in terms of the context of orbital angular momentum. And this experiment was actually done with silver atoms. And our current understanding is that if you look at the orbital angular momentum of all of those electrons in the silver atoms added up together, it cancels out and gives zero. And what's left is only the orbital angular momentum, excuse me, the spin angular momentum in one electron that's left. So there's like a shell of silver atoms that all cancel each other out. And there's one sort of leftover, if you look on the periodic table, there's one leftover electron in the silver atom. And it's the spin of that one last 
electron that's being measured in this experiment. But it was misinterpreted in terms of the spinning around electron. And it wasn't, so the experiment was done in 1921. Our friends Gauchman and Uhlenbeck were 1925. So in principle, there were four years where people could have figured out that the stuart gerlach experiment was electron spin. And it didn't happen, I believe, until 27 or so when people actually figured out that stern gerlach was the electron spin. Let me just ask, if this had been orbital angular momentum, would there have been a third That's dot? Yeah, that's right. So in fact, that's true. So uh, one of the things that I didn't emphasize, I'll write it up here, um, is that for these, for, the, for this spinning around spin, we had two choices. And in units of this fundamental constant, those are your two choices for the amount of bar magnet spin. Uh, for, for, uh, sorry, on, on, your, on your axis spin. For the, the orbiting around spin, it turns out that if you look at the amount of spin along a given axis, It's in units of one, which is why it's spin one rather than spin zero, uh, spin one half. But it actually goes in integer steps from one to zero to minus one. So the, the postcard is the data is not perfect because it's you know real life, um, and so it doesn't. Their initial data doesn't look like that. Their initial data looks like a spread of stuff kind of here and a spread of stuff kind of here. But there isn't anything here. There's not a big dot there, which you would have expected, actually, if this were orbital angular momentum. So that was another puzzle that they maybe could have figured out. I don't know. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's actually another good point, that they could have been a clue. I heard a story, I don't know if you heard this, that um, the assistants or students who took uh, the data originally, uh, it's silver atoms, yes. and they were supposed to hit a plate. Um, and they took it, there was nothing. And they took yes, it to I know this story. Yeah. Stern, you can finish the story. Oh, so the story is, so there's actually a very, there's a nice article about this in the Physics Today from uh, maybe a decade ago. And the title of it is something, How Cigar Changed Physics. Uh, and so the story is supposed to be that, I don't remember, maybe you remember if it was Stern or Gerlach, I don't remember which, uh, used to like to smoke rather cheap cigars, apparently. And so the story was that he breathed his cigar smoke on this uh, photographic plate. And upon breathing the smoke on the photographic plate, it developed the, 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 the silver atoms were, were visible. And so, so it's how I, it's, I think the title of the article is how a cigar helped reorient physics or something like that, yeah. OK, uh, questions from the audience? Uh, wait for the microphone, please. Yes, uh, you told a story about uh, Uhlenbeck and uh, Gutsmith uh, submitted, or it was submitted through Ehrenfest, but and at some point they discovered something about the speed of light, or had it had exceeded. Oh, so the, but, the speed of light was, uh, yeah, so let me go through that a bit more slowly. So, so th this is a little bit related to this question about um, they were not thinking that it was OK to say just, I have spin stapled to a particle in the same way that we have charge stapled to a particle. They were starting to try and think about, should I have a mechanistic model in my head for a spinning electron? And then they knew that sort of this was the amount of spinning I needed. This is the amount of angular momentum they needed. And people at the time had an idea of what was called the classical radius of the electron. And so if you take a spinning object that has radius of the classical radius of the electron with the amount of charge that the electron has, and you say, I need this big of a bar magnet, you could figure out how fast it has to be spinning. And the answer is it needs to be spinning in excess of the speed of light. And so that got them really worried. And so that's, today we don't worry about that because we don't think about this as a tiny little ball of charge that's spinning, right? We just think that spin is something that is built into the atom in the same way that charge, or excuse me, an electron in the same way that charge is built into an electron. It doesn't need to be like a, a tiny little ball. And so that's why we don't talk about 
a tiny little ball because it would be spinning in a way that didn't make sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, I got a story kind of in a question as well. They're unrelated, though. <laughs> so Richard Feynman did a rather um, interesting lecture on electromagnetism. And he was saying that um, nuclear energy should be re renamed electrostatic energy because the protons that are trying to get away from each other are held by the strong nuclear force. And actually disrupting that nuclear force is what causes the two to split apart. And it, it, if anything, um, the sh nuclear force is a subtraction from the amount of energy that's being created. It's just kind of interesting. But along those lines, when an atom split, is there any, what happens to electrons in that atom that's splitting? Uh, you're and, asking and also like to nuclear the spin. fission or something? What'd you say? You're asking in fission, for example? Yeah, or? in fission, when you're splitting an atom, yeah, what so happens to the original electrons that were in that atom that was split? So, there, the so there, the, one thing that's interesting is that the scales that are involved in an atom are wildly disparate. So um, the, as many of you know from perhaps the previous Saturday physics, if nowhere else, um, if you think about an atom, the size of an atom is something like an angstrom, which is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. And the size, not drawn to scale, of a nucleus is about a femtometer, which is 10 to the minus 15 meters. And so um, nuclear physics and atomic physics are operating on, or sorry, the, when I say atomic physics, actually that's a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because a lot of times people talk about atomic physics and nuclear physics as being synonymous. Um, but the physics of the atom as a whole, which includes the electrons and the nucleus, are operating on very different scales. They're off, uh, in terms of size, they're also operating on very different scales in terms of energy, which is of course why uh, nuclear energy uh, is, gives off so much energy. The, the sort of scales that are associated with the binding of protons and neutrons inside of a nucleus is something like mega electron volts, whereas the binding of electrons is electron volts. And this mega is 10 to the 6. And so the energies associated with what's happening in a nuclear fission process are far in excess of anything to do with the binding of the electrons to uh, those particular atoms. And so if this thing is getting mega electron volts of energy, then the electrons aren't even going to, are, are not even going to have time to react to that, basically. OK, um, some, another question from online. Um, so th this is fairly straightforward, uh, perhaps. But why is this smile? <laughs> Or oh, frown, you know. so uh, you may know more than I do, but I think that, that this was just uh, a had to do with the details of the magnetic field gradient. I think so, uh, rather than it just being, you know, super sharp. Then, depending on exactly the spread of your beam, you feel a different amount of gradient, and then you don't go up or down as much. Right. So it's the way the magnetic field changes over distance yes. uh, that has a dependence on this direction. Sorry, That's so I'm glad I have an experimentalist. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, okay, and um, here's a, a, a couple of interesting questions. So uh, you did not spin the bike wheel. I did not spin it, the bike wheel, but I could do it, and <laughs> you're gonna get me in trouble, but, so if we spin the bike wheel, so one, one of the ways we could spin the bike wheel, is it's another way to see the procession, right? So you can see, I, let me, let me uh, give it a little bit. There we go. So you can see it start to process. And there, the procession is not due to some external magnetic field. That's due to the gravitational field of the Earth. I don't know. Is that what you're, you're wondering if I was going to use this for something well, good? Or is there that, a question? <laughs> the questions, though, yeah. are when it's spinning, 
um, is, is does it become a magnet, you know, because the electrons are spinning? I see. So the, the bike wheel as a whole is electrically neutral. And so uh, the, when we, I talked about a current being the reason that you had a magnet. So there's not really a current here. I suppose there could be a universe in which I got a, a lot of a static charge on here somehow and then gave it a spin. But aside from that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it to act like a magnet. There's also a question about um, if you do have, do, does electron spin last forever? Or as far as we know, yeah, it's it's electrons. Diamonds are forever. Atoms are forever. Electron spins are forever. I mean, this is uh, you know one of the things that's great about uh, about atoms is they don't get tired. Um, you know, this this is uh, really actually important for things like atomic clocks. So when uh, you're building an ordinary clock, you have to worry about is that thing gonna lose energy. Is, it going to, is friction going to cause that thing to lose accuracy over time? But uh, the, or, or, or if you're trying to build two clocks, am I going to build those clocks exactly the same? And, or there's going to be some difference, and because of the way I built my different pendula uh, with slightly different lengths or something, those things will get, get out of sync. Uh, atoms are atoms are atoms. Electrons are electrons are electrons. And because of that, it allows you to, to build a clock that is not... Uh, predicated on your ability to, to build a super accurate pendulum. OK, I know there's a question here. Let me repeat the, uh, what I learned. Electron, magnetic field have two kinds. One is rotating around its own axis. The other one is there is a bigger picture both, we can see this, the um, spin theory is about? Uh, in a sense. So the rotating around its own axis, uh, I would like to, like Uhlenbeck and Gauchschmidt, be a little scared of that picture because of it spinning faster than the speed of light. But you could, I like that heuristic because it is something inherent to the electron, just like when we think about the Earth spinning around its own axis, it's inherent to the, the Earth. So there's the around its own axis, uh, there's a spin that's just stapled to the electron, and then there's also the uh, associated with it being in the atom orbiting around the proton. So yes. The fun question is the link the wave theory rather than just consider it as a particle. I couldn't quite catch that. Uh, there is one is particle theory, one is this wave theory, explain uh -huh. those things. I just want to, if you can link these two things. Uh, ah, so, so I guess the, the question was about uh, par particles versus waves a little bit, which is always a question in quantum mechanics. So, um, so when I talk about the orbit of the atom, and we talk about Bohr's model, we talk about the sort of solar system model of the, the atom, uh, that, that, that is much more, uh, that, that is an older heuristic, and we can still learn a lot from it. But now, typically, when we talk about um, the properties of atoms, we use Schrodinger's wave equation. Uh, and there's still a sense in which there's, uh, we could talk about there being an angular momentum of different states of the atom using those wave equations. Um, but it doesn't have that simple picture of the particle orbiting around. What else did you discover in the Bentley archive that's fun? Yeah, so there are many great things. So uh, let me, I have at least one other letter I want to show. Um, so, so the first thing I'll say is it's, it's absolutely amazing. You could go there, and it's actually open to the public. You have to make an appointment. But you could find letters, uh, correspondence between uh, Uhlenbeck and Fermi and Oppenheimer and Bohr and a letter of congratulations from Heis Heisenberg saying, I think you guys are really on to something with this spin. I'm a little bit concerned about some factor of two, which you know, maybe is eventually going to work itself out, but it seems like you're really on to something. Um, 
And so here, here's an example of one thing I found. And it's amazing, because these are letters in their own hand, right? So you can hold in your hand a letter from Heisenberg or a letter from uh, Bohr, or, uh, these, these, these giants. And so this one I really liked a lot. Uh, this is a letter from Uhlenbeck to Fermi. So one of the things that uh, the, you could go and find a plaque for outside Randall Lab is in recognition of the Ann Arbor Summer Schools. So uh, in, in around 1930, uh, Harrison Randall uh, was instrumental in setting up these summer schools. And they invited a number of physicists to come over from Europe and teach people about quantum mechanics. Because quantum mechanics was largely developed in Europe, and they had to come to the US in some way. And one of the ways in which it came to the US were these summer schools in Ann Arbor. And so this letter is a letter from Uhlenbeck to Fermi. And it says, you know, dear Fermi, uh, finally I'll respond, answer your letter, which only one reached me. I guess maybe he was delinquent in responding. But then he goes on, it's like a three or four page letter, and it tells him things. When you get to New York, you're going to need to give somebody a dollar to give your steamer trunk on the train. You're going to need to take this train to Ann Arbor. Don't worry, uh, uh, it'll get, your trunk will get there automatically. Um, if you go out to dinner, you should tip 10%, but don't tip in Ann Arbor because it's a university town. You don't tip in university towns. Uh, you should not bring a, you don't need to bring a tux, though you didn't say it that way, because you know, the dress in the United States is very formal. Uh, a black suit is good enough. Uh, or very informal, excuse me, a black suit is good enough. I can't imagine that informal today would not be a black suit, but there it is. Um, and you know, just reading these discussions back and forth between these people, it was amazing. I, like I said, the, the letters in Dutch between Gauchmann and Uhlenbeck, you know, I would look at them and be Dutch, 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 Dutch. Equation, I understand that. Dutch, 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 Dutch. <laughs> and so then, uh, so, so that, was, that was pretty great. Um, and they have copies of, of, of old papers. There's, uh, you could read referee reports. Like I said, Gauchmann was the chief editor of this journal. And there were all of the, the one thing that was in English from Uhlenbeck to Gauchmann would be, Gauchmann would say, could you tell me your opinion on this paper? And there would be the referee reports that Uhlenbeck would write back about these papers and say, oh, this is garbage, don't publish it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, if you're at all interested in the, the history of physics, it's really a, a, a treat to go there and see all of these things. Oh, and uh, we, we still have summer schools here. So the Lineweber Center for Theoretical Physics um, is hosting a cosmology summer school this summer. Um, and so that's a tradition that's uh, ongoing. That's great. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, you're going to love this one, I think, okay. which is, is there a relationship between uh, the uncertainty principle, uh, for example, momentum and position or energy and time, and the fact that uh, you can only measure one projection, one direction uh, that the spin is pointing, say along z, but not along x or y? Yes, there is. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to um, I have to think about if there's a great way to, to, to explain this. So um, it turns out, so if, if you know one thing from quantum mechanics, it might be Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. If you measure x really precisely, you can't measure p. Or if you measure p really precisely, you can't measure x. And there's, you know, the kind of thing that appears on a t-shirt is uh, you know, delta x delta p is greater than h bar, this is something like this. Um, and so, uh, and it turns out that there's another, uh, you could derive this from another equation, which I'll write it down and I won't try to explain in detail, but there's another equation. So this says something about fancy operators in quantum mechanics that uh, says that there's, um, this is something called a commutator, and I don't want to necessarily go into the detail, but there's a structure that says that these objects have this mathematical relation, and from that you can derive this. Um, and it turns out that anytime you have a relation like chip like this, there's a corresponding uncertainty principle. And it turns out for spin, uh, and, and actually I didn't talk too much about this, so the question was a prescient question, that you can only measure the spin along one axis, and if you measure the spin along the z-axis, you don't simultaneously get to know the spin along the x-axis. And that's, again, 
uh, sort of the foundation of a lot of the quantum information and quantum technology people talk about today. It's one of the ways that you can build, um, there's uh, something called quantum cryptography. You could build secure quantum codes uh, using this basic observation. So if you measure spin along one axis, you can't spin, measure spin along another. And it turns out that there is an exactly analogous uh, equation like this. But instead of x and p, it involves different components of spin. And because of that, there's also a uncertainty principle associated with the measurements of spin along different axes. So indeed, there is an uncertainty principle that's associated with measuring spin along different axes. Um, and if you take my junior level quantum mechanics class, I'll spend many lectures on it. I think registration's still open. <laughs> All right, well, um, awesome. Thanks so much, Aaron. My absolute and pleasure. Thank you so much for coming.